नमस्कार गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन वेलकम टू द डेली न्यूज एनालिसिस दैट गोज बाय द नेम ऑफ एडिटोरियल एज आई एम भुवन अपूर्व झा एंड यू आर विथ स्टडी आई क्यू आई ए एस इंग्लिश वंस अगेन आई वेलकम ईच वन ऑफ यू हुएवर इज जॉइनिंग मी लाइव एंड अगेन दोज हु विल बी वॉचिंग दिस लेक्चर इन द आर्स एंड द डेज टू कम वंस अगेन वेलकम एवरी वन वी आर बैक आफ्टर अ ब्रीफ ब्रेक after saturday sunday that we had off and so we are back we have a, a host of important news that we have to take a look at but essentially the scope of this class is going to be focused on two articles two articles that are of extreme importance in so far as we are looking to combat mains 2023 as well as prelims 2023 okay the questions that can be drafted from these two topics are varied which is why it requires you to have a comprehensive understanding as well as the ability to analyze the different facets that are involved uh, with these two particular topics okay right so without further ado the first article obviously right in front of you is the collapse of the ukrainian kakhovka dam uh, and, and the whole resultant uh, ecocide allegations that have come forward if you haven't been following this news well it's a major disaster that has unfolded in uh, the kherson region okay k h e r s o n the kherson region so this is happening in the russia because of the russia ukraine conflict and so uh, well obviously the ukraine conflict obviously has a human facet to it it has an uh, environmental facet to it it has a uh, economical facet to it okay all of that has been discussed previously thoroughly but today we are going to focus on that environment bit specifically the allegation of an ecocide happening okay the whole organ the whole uh, problem is that the actions of whoever has done whatever they have done i'll tell you in a moment that has led to the allegations of ecocide so what exactly is ecocide what is at stake here we will try and understand all of that the second article is obviously something that most of you would probably overlook when reading newspapers about museums and it's completely relatable why people would not be keen to read about museums because again none of us really pay much attention to it however in the context of the role that they play you know museums have an immense role and so our understanding of museums is probably just limited to say uh, the national museum or the salar jung museum or whatever is there in your t- particular town or city however there are many different kinds of museums okay you have natural museums you have fossil museums you have event specific museums you have culture museums so we need to have a look at all of that and obviously from the mains perspective a ready made question that can straight away be framed for this is examine the role of the museums you know do you have the ability to understand the impact that a museum has on say not just the contemporary uh, society but also as a repository of artifacts as a repository of information and knowledge in terms of the cross linking between the museum as a repository of knowledge vis-a-vis the impact it has on the population where does museum fit in is it just supposed to be a storehouse of artifacts or is there a bigger role that a museum can play okay so we'll take a look at that because again it's it's a very simple topic okay when if you if you look at it uh, prima facie it's a very simple topic but then the linkages that can be f- formed from the whole museum context are immense so we'll have a look at both of them and obviously like we do in every class we will have mains questions as well as multiple choice questions for the benefit of all those of you who are looking to appear in the mains who are waiting for the results in fact which are expected i am given to believe any day now and thereafter those obviously who are preparing in the longer term for upsc 2024 Right so before we just jump into the topics again for those of you who are joining me for the first time this is editorial edge daily news analysis monday to saturday 8 am where we deep dive into a particular topic okay ideally we have around 2 to 3 articles that we take a look at the whole intention of this class is not just to read the newspaper in front of you no it is to provide you with actual analysis points that you can use in your examination information that you should be able to recall at the drop of a hat okay so treat this class as an analysis class plus also as a revision class because most of the stuff that we will be doing will be discussing you must have read 
or if you haven't read well obviously you'll read it for the first time okay good morning rajan welcome welcome everyone who's watching me live i welcome each one of you so let's get started uh, with the topic first the first one obviously is the topic vis-a-vis -vis what's happening in russia ukraine but like we always do before we start any particular topic we will take a look at a potential mains question that can be drafted from the topic as well as a prelims question that can be understood from the topic so let's just take a look at these two questions first and thereafter we'll move on to the particular discussion okay first one man-made ecological catastrophe have impacts not just as fast moving disasters but also as slow moving catastrophes okay so basically that man-made ecological disasters have short-term as well as long-term impacts okay so analyze the whole statement in light of the russia ukraine conflict okay again a mirror image possibly of what upsc may ask you they will obviously paraphrase the whole question they'll make it much more shorter but then you will be asked to analyze the impact of a conflict in terms of just not not just the short term effect on that particular area but also the long term effect specifically if you look at it in the russia ukraine context we'll understand what has happened and what are the ecological consequences of whatever has happened okay and the second question from uh, the prelims perspective all those of you who are looking for for the prelims perspective well here is a question for you number 1 river neper flows from russia to belarus to ukraine and then drains into the black sea is it correct or not number 2 Ukraine often called the breadbasket of the world has ample availability of the black chernozem which in organic matter called humus so which of the statements above are correct no options provided because well there's no point okay we have seen what has happened this year so we'll just learn the facts and then prepare ourselves for the kind of questions that whatever can be thrown at you so if you know the answer to this quickly shoot the answer in the comment box i'd like to see your answers don't google obviously if you know the or if you want to attempt this please i have requested in the past some students have in fact taken the lead and mailed me their answers i have been in touch with them however i would again request you if you are interested in understanding from the mains perspective how are you to frame an answer what are going to be the key constituents of your answer the key ingredients that you have to include in your answer what figures could you possibly include if you want to discuss all of that and more well follow me on my official uh, telegram channel the link for which i will share with you or you can mail me okay there are students who are in touch with me and i'd love to help each one of you so if you have answers for this you can either mail me or you can uh, leave me the answer in the comment box below right so if you know the answer do to this do let me know in the chat box below quickly so let's look at what is where is the neper river so this exactly is the course of the neper river as you can see okay now the neper river origination waldai hills make a note of this very quickly waldai hills in russia the river starts from there thereafter goes into belarus thereafter comes to ukraine and finally drains into the black sea so it's essentially a trans boundary river that you must have understood by now okay it's a trans boundary river the neper river okay again very important to know at least the countries that it passes through where it drains okay so now what has exactly happened in terms of the neper river so there was a dam here guys the kakhovka dam okay the kakhovka dam was here let's assume it to be here now this kakhovka dam obviously it's in a conflict area okay russia and ukraine are at a war for quite some time and so this becomes like a critical area a strategic asset that needs to be controlled okay so now there was going on shelling and bombing all of that was happening around the dam area since last year okay in fact last year also there was some structural damage caused to the dam due to the continuous artillery shelling you must have known you must know what is artillery shelling so because of artillery shelling last year in the year 2022 you had some sort of damage damage to the dam gates good morning arka welcome welcome everyone so there was damage to the dam gates because of artillery shelling last year now after that well russians obviously control the area okay russians were controlling this dam and thereafter in the last 7 days what has happened is not 7 days 5 6 days in fact what has happened is that this dam 
has been breached. Breached essentially is destroyed in a sense that a dam that was supposed to control water. Well, now that has been broken, water is gushing out. It's going into the low-lying areas. Okay. So, who caused that particular damage? The Russians control it. They deny, saying, well, we stand to gain nothing out of it. Why would we do this? The Ukrainians are accusing the Russians that, well, it's a terrorist activity. You have done this to essentially rob Ukraine of its uh, uh, economic resources, cause, it, cause a lot of problem. It's in fact, 35 people have been killed because of the flash flood that occurred after the dam was destroyed. Okay. So Ukraine says, well, Russia has done it. Russia says Ukraine has done it. We have no particular answers. Just like you must have heard the Nord Stream was destroyed. Okay, or at least compromised the Nord Stream, the gas pipeline that can, can, uh, goes from Russia to uh, the European Union, to so Germany. So the Nord Stream was again also uh, compromised. So this is the second such incident that has happened. Good morning, Sugiani. So, so welcome. Welcome, everyone. So the Nord Stream was damaged. Thereafter, you have suddenly now the Kakhovka Dam. So just note down the name, guys. Because you must have seen that UPSC loves asking these questions. Which area? Kherson belongs to where? Dnieper River will, belongs to where? Okay, Kakhovka Dam, where? The areas that are in news, make sure you know the head and tail of it. Everything, okay? So, this particular dam, the Kakhovka Dam, now we know that has been destroyed. Water is flowing out. Massive rate. Now, suddenly, this low-lying area that you see, just before it drains into the Black Sea, now that has all gotten flooded. Extensive flooding has happened. Like I told you, 35 people have lost their lives and that is just the human aspect of this catastrophe. Okay. So after that, what we need to understand is that there is a bigger thing at play. Obviously, there is an anthropological loss of life. People have lost their lives, their property. The way of life has been compromised. Suddenly, 18 feet flood has been seen. Water level has risen up to 18 feet above uh, what it used to be before the dam was breached. So you can understand like the completely, it's, it's destroyed the life there. However, our focus of discussion is that we'll not just look at the people, the people's properties, but we'll also look at the property of the nature, the environment angle of this catastrophe. Okay. So let's go forward now. Uh, just make sure that you know the Valdai Hills, guys. Okay. Where does the river originate? The Valdai Hills in Russia. Thereafter, two more countries, Belarus, then Ukraine, and then finally, it drains into the Black Sea. This whole area, guys, now that you must have noticed, the slope is somewhat like this, downwards. What essentially is happening is it used to uh, make sure that the water would go at full speed. There would be an increase in the speed of water, which is why a series of dams were constructed from the source right till the end. Okay. So this is called the Dnipro River Cascade. Okay. Cascade is basically the whole uh, theme of the area, the whole uh, project, wherein a series of dams were constructed. This particular dam, the Kahovka Dam, is the southernmost dam in that cascade, which means after the Kakhovka Dam, there is no dam up till Black Sea. So you cannot stop the water anywhere. There is no uh, like speed breaker for the water. It's going to essentially go at full speed, inundate everything in its path, and then drain into the Black Sea. Okay. Another such problem. Hi, Bulbul. Welcome. So this is the problem. You do not have another checkpoint for to basically arrest the speed of water. Okay. So make sure you no note down that cascade term also. Okay. The Dnieper River Cascade, it is called, or the Kahovka Dam Cascade. So let's go forward now and understand why is this dam important. Obviously, you must have figured out that if it starts from Russia, goes to Belarus, then Ukraine, and then into Black Sea, it's a big river. In fact, it's the fourth largest river in Europe. Okay, the fourth largest. So obviously, it's got a lot of water volume that it carries with itself, a lot of importance for the people of the area for the wildlife of the area, ecosystems have been formed around the river and now suddenly you have the dam being broken and the river now raking havoc. Okay, river has gone completely out of control. So, the Kahovka Dam was 
I have used was because well, it's no more a dam now. Okay, it does not serve the purpose of being a dam anymore. So it was on the Dnieper or Dnipro River in Kherson Oblast, Ukraine. Dnipro River, I have told you the whole uh, sense of it from Russia to Belarus to Ukraine and then to the Black Sea. Okay, so this territory, like I uh, just informed you, under the control of the Russians. Primary purpose is hydroelectric power, fast moving river, slope is like this towards the Black Sea. So obviously the river water has momentum, you can harness it for hydroelectricity. So point number one that we need to know. And thereafter, navigation and irrigation. Irrigation obviously, with any river you will be able to irrigate, you will be at least able to source water from there. And navigation, because the river was such, it was huge, it was quite big in diameter. Okay, So it, it gave ample space and ample water depth for uh, ferries to navigate those water channels. In fact, Ukrainians used to use this as a mode of transport also. So now with these, all of this gone, Straight away, you can see how it would affect the country. No more, this is possible. No more, you can do this because it's flooded anyways. What irrigation when it's fully flooded? Okay. And navigation, obviously, because the river water is just far too dangerous to navigate right now. So the deep water channel created by the downstream flow allowed shipping up and down the river. Now we come to the economic angle of this. What were the Ukrainians shipping? You might ask. Ukrainians are, see, Ukraine is also called one of the bread baskets of the world. Now you will see, if you just go and, just go and look at the term bread basket of the world. So you will find USA claiming to be the bread basket of the world. Argentina claiming to be the bread basket of the world. Most of the countries, like the fertile soil ones, will claim to be it. And they are not incorrect. Okay. Because uh, every country has a particular area or at least not every country, most of the countries have particular areas where a lot of production happens, crop production, cereal production, all of that happens. Ukraine, the particular area that I'm telling you about, 64% of the wheat that they grow, okay, wheat is the primary product by the way, wheat and cereals in this area, they are sending it to Africa, they are sending it to China, small country like Ukraine. So one might obviously think that, well, what would be the primary exports of the Ukrainians? Probably arms and ammunition. They wouldn't be incorrect, obviously. But at the same time, they're also called the breadbasket of that area. A lot of the cereals, a lot of the grains that they would produce would finally be exported to the low-income countries in Africa. Now you can understand that with this shipping gone, with the area where you used to grow the crops gone, so, again, Ukraine's economy is going to be hurt majorly. At the same time, you're looking at a humanitarian crisis in Africa, people who would have to find some other source for the grains that they consume, for the cereals that they consume. See how one problem there, one dam broke and suddenly someone has to go hungry in Africa. Okay. So, this is the linkage that we often talk about. You should be able to draw this linkage or at least showcase it in your answer. Okay. Next, we'll take a look at another problem that is the Zaforiza nuclear power plant, the biggest nuclear power plant uh, in Europe, by the way. Okay. So now first instance when uh, the, the whole uh, uh, dam broke was that, well, are we looking at another Fukushima? Are we looking at another Chernobyl? Okay. If you do not know what Fukushima and Chernobyl are, they, well, they were nuclear power reactors where they had a meltdown. What is the meltdown? That you are unable to cool the reactor. You need a coolant uh, to cool down the reactor. And so, the first instance was that with now water unavailable, will this be compromised too? Thankfully, they have another water source there. A big lake is there near the nuclear power plant. So, they are not going to be facing a nuclear meltdown. However, this is another concept that we need to know that, well, it's not just agrarian, it's not just shipping, it's not just irrigation, but also it's got to do with a nuclear power plant that is lying in its vicinity. So you can understand the sensitivity of that area now. This is just the human part. We have not even started with the environment part yet. Okay. So critical, sensitive area, guys. Okay. It irrigates areas of northern Crimea at northern Crimea canal fine. This is not very important, but you have to understand this. 
the different tangents that this particular uh, river, this particular dam was serving. Now let's go forward and have a look at the environmental factor, the topic of the class for today. So what is ecocide? Again, it's to do with ecology plus genocide. Okay, so you can understand that mass scale destruction of ecologic, ecological system or say flora, fauna, the biodiversity of that place has been compromised. How you ask? Again, flooding. Okay, imagine what happens in Kaziranga. So you must have seen news, newspaper reports no? that just as the monsoons hit that part of the country, Assam and, and the northeast, suddenly you see these uh, magnificent looking rhinoceros standing on the highway. You must, see, you must have seen those photos. What happens exactly is that animals cannot uh, respond very quickly to that kind of sudden flash floods. Many are obviously lost. They lose their uh, lives. And this is just animals who have the power of mobility that they can go from point A to point B. Imagine what the plants, the trees, no. the benthic population of the river, nothing. It's all lost. Okay. So we'll look at the problem now, the ecological problem of the dam breaking, the Kahovka dam breaking. What has happened now? Flooding, obviously, number one. It risks permanently destroying the rich animal habitats and plant species. First one. What habitat you will be asking now? What is, what habitat do you have in Ukraine of all places? Well, there is the Black Sea Biosphere Reserve. Mandated by the UNESCO as a protected area. Okay, this biosphere reserve is one of the most important places in that particular region. It houses the most extreme, uh, the most uh, sensitive of uh, flora, of fauna, of animals, of insects, of birds, everything. So, what has been predicted now? Ecologic, ecologists have said that the Black Sea Biosphere Reserve, home to thousands of species, and the Oleshki sands. Go and have a look at what are Oleshki sands. Okay, go and have, uh, have a look at it. Have a look at the pictures of Oleshki sands and you'll understand exactly how beautiful is it. So, the Black Sea Biosphere Reserve and the Oleshki sands will be the most affected by the flooding. Straight away, you are looking at a sensitive ecological area whose whole sanctity has been compromised because the dam has broken. The links now, you can understand, not just in local, there's an IR concept also vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine and Africa. And now there's an environmental concept also vis-a-vis -vis the biosphere reserve. So the Kakovska water reserve. Now what is the Kakovska water reserve? So if you have a river like this, okay, if this is the dam, so essentially this becomes like a huge reservoir of water. Yes. So this is the Kakovka water reservoir or reserve which existed above the dam and was used by migrating birds. The fact that floods could carry pollutants. Now what has happened is, look at this dam. If this dam was here, you are say downstream. You are towards the Black Sea. Here I am standing as the dam. Now the dam has broken. Obviously this was an area of conflict. What the Russians had done was stored oil and arms and ammunition and whatever they need essentially in a conflict area, was stored in the walls of the dam. With the dam having broken now, all of that oil, all of that pollutant, essentially, is now a part of the water. It's a part of the river water of Dnieper River. So what essentially has happened is, that you're looking at close to 600 to 800 tons of oil that has been released in the Dnieper River. 600 to 800 tons of oil are part of the river water passing through the Black Sea Biosphere Reserve, eventually going to drain into the Black Sea. You can understand what I'm hinting at that is actually going to be a massive catastrophe. You are going to be looking at a situation where several species and their existence could be compromised. Okay? So, Pollutants, heavy metals and fertilizers, all of this was stored in the dam. All of that is now a part of this system of the Black Sea Biosphere Reserve. And eventually it will flush down to the Black Sea, which will obviously affect the marine life. 
see how a small problem how a small problem eventually cascades into a bigger thing so now going back to the question that i was telling you about guys this is how you are going to learn and this is how you are going to remember because remembering and recalling is a major part of upsc you might learn all the topics but if you can't recall during the time of the examination what's the point so this and this you can understand now the fast moving connotations as well as the slow moving connotations the short term impact the long term impact all of this that i'm discussing right now they are the short term impacts you are looking at flooding this that and this is the long term impact migrating birds having to shift their area okay uh, you looking at marine life being disrupted long term you never know what's going to happen now okay natural parks created with the goal of preserving threatened or unique animals found on the red list what is the red list the iucn red list we will discuss what is exactly if you do not know what is the iucn red list what is its importance give me 30 seconds we will discuss it okay so this this area has species which are found on the iucn list the red list imagine if you suddenly had say flooding somewhere in say like the baksa tiger reserve or jaldapada national park in india or say uh, one of the most uh, say the western ghats something uh, catastrophical happened and you suddenly looking at say all of these gibbons and this and that suddenly going out of like oh my god same thing is happening here okay areas in ukraine are part of the emerald network one more learning guys one is obviously the iucn red list and now we will learn about what is the emerald network what exactly is it a part of we'll understand that a pan european network of areas of special conservation interest having also been affected essentially you please understand we'll we'll discuss this don't worry we'll discuss this right now in the next slide but understand the overall concept that i'm trying to introduce to you that you're looking at problems of flooding you're looking at problems of transportation you're looking at problems of economy you're looking at problems of flora fauna being affected marine life being affected okay environmental pollution 600 to 800 tons of uh, gallons of uh, uh, oil okay so now that you have understood the whole contours of the discussion that okay this is the problem statement and this these are the problems that i'm looking at quickly understand these two things now because if you include them in your answers that's going to secure you points because everyone else will be giving vague vague same same generic terms you will introduce some nice concept there so first let's look at the iucn list the iucn list essentially the iucn red list for those of you who do not know it's it's a data book that is published by the iucn which essentially uh, classifies animals plant species animal species fungus whatever you look at it all of them are classified in nine particular groups okay nine groups essentially saying that is the particular species critical is completely extinct or is it of least concern and then varying uh, degrees between there okay so depending on the threat vulnerability to a particular species for example uh say indian elephant not endangered at all found in numbers habitat may be getting compromised but number wise it is there at the same time say if you look at uh, red panda okay can someone tell me though in india in which particular area is the x c2 conservation of red panda being carried out here's a question for the chat there is one particular in fact two particular areas in the country where x c2 conservation if you know what is x c2 conservation of red panda is being carried out where is it happening guys can someone tell me in fact at the same place you have x c2 conservation of a snow leopard also being carried out okay so have a look if you do not know we'll discuss i'll give you the answer okay so the iucn red list so i've told you from depending on the threat vulnerability it is divided into nine particular groups quickly note down the nine groups so that you remember okay so that you will remember and and it's important this is how you are going to revise guys every morning is a kind of revision class plus an introductory class for new new ideas okay we'll begin from the top 
the the begin the absolute threatened one in fact so first one is extinct okay extinct is essentially that you don't find it in the wild you don't find it in uh, protection also okay know where it is from completely zero uh, population anywhere in the world so that's extinct thereafter you have extinct in the wild okay extinct in the wild like I, the name tells you it it survives say only in captivity but in the wild you do not find any particular number of that species okay only in the wild uh, only in captivity in say zoos or these particular centers there might be one or two samples available units available otherwise in the wild you don't find them thereafter you have critically endangered okay totally vulnerable right yes bulbul not in jammu and kashmir no i'll tell you the answers guys good good attempt though bulbul but where in india do you find red panda as well as snow leopard just think for a moment do you find red panda in kashmir i don't think so i've never seen there yeah, i've been to kashmir i haven't find, found one okay so critically endangered thereafter we look at endangered now these are the various levels guys okay nine particular levels is what it is divided into make sure that you know all of them then you have vulnerable okay vulnerable is there thereafter you have near threatened least concern okay and 8 and 9 what are they what is this d d and n e these are the nine groups guys which iucn classifies in okay any particular species will be a part of these nine groups extinct extinct in the wild critically endangered endangered vulnerable near threatened thereafter least concern this is data deficient that you do not have enough data that the survey is yet to be conducted so you cannot specifically say that a particular species belongs in these groups so this is like data deficient and thereafter this is what what is ne not evaluated okay you haven't evaluated it yet data deficient is that you have evaluated but you don't have data arunachal pradesh is a good 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 guess rajan in fact arunachal pradesh is is one state where you find both snow leopard and uh, uh, red panda however the x c2 conservation bit that i told you what is in c2 in the situation x c2 outside the particular situation so in if you look at it in the padmaja naidu himalayan zoological park p n h z p okay just in india's case if you discuss the p n h z p who can tell me where is this the padmaja naidu himalayan zoological park so this particular national park or zoological park it runs conservation programs for two particular major species one is the red panda which is called aliris fulgens i believe and thereafter you have the snow leopard where is the pnhzp the padmaja naidu himalayan zoological park quickly let me know in the chat without googling guys in fact within this very campus of padmaja naidu himalayan zoological park you have another very ins uh, important institute called the himalayan mountaineering institute hmi okay you have the hmi here the himalayan mountaineering institute they share a con they share a, a border in fact a, a campus yes correct west bengal it is good correct bahut acha answer kudal it is in fact in darjeeling okay the queen of the hills it is called no darjeeling so if you were to ever go to darjeeling make sure that you pay attention to these two particular institutes there one the padmaja naidu himalayan zoological park within that very campus no they share a campus the hmi and the pnhzp have a look at that hmi is from where tenzing norgay first uh, went ahead and and climbed mount everest he retired as the director of hmi okay so anyways i i di i digress from the topic so the iucn essentially has said that well there is red list species that are there in black sea biosphere reserve and that they are at complete risk you are looking at species that are probably critically endangered or endangered now with this having been understood let's look at the emerald network now 
the emerald network again this is to do with protected areas areas of conservational interest so all these european countries got together and said here you know what your your particular state your particular country has this area my particular country has this area let's form a body let's form a program where we are able to support each other for conservation for preservation for protection so they all got together and formed this emerald network essentially to do with areas of protection or protected areas in european countries however they have now also included areas in africa okay so you have countries like say uh, burkina faso i believe okay tunisia morocco in these three african countries so emerald network is now including them okay so again if you get the statement the examination er, emerald countries are a group of country uh, uh, or uh, sorry emerald network is a network for special areas of environmental interest in europe only in correct statement not just in europe but also in africa specifically in these countries okay so it's like a grouping an alliance of all of these countries that they got together they'll have knowledge sharing information sharing training capacity building all of that to be done so that the animals and all of that can be preserved okay so now that you know iucn red list as well as the emerald network make a note of this guys because this is important very important specifically from this particular conversation that we are having okay all right so now let's go forward and look at very quickly at the species that are at risk what exactly now now that i've told you all of this bad story that either the russians or the ukrainians have done so much is wrong with whatever they have done what are the individual species that we're looking at who are being threatened number 1 is a rare ant species i'm not even going to try say this because i can't <laughs> okay so you have the rare ant species and uh, all of this they are located in the flooded area so you are looking at the rare ant species lip leomatopum microcephalum okay so that's going to be gone you are looking at nordman's birch mouse you are looking at sand mole rat steppy viper caspian whip snakes this is the steppy viper by the way guys okay it's supposed to be a very beautiful snake i was looking at it of a uh, looking at a video of it on youtube and uh, it's commonly found again in in the ukraine in area the kherson area and and it's a beautiful looking snake but the problem is that it is again under intense pressure from say encroachment by human areas and uh, uh, hunting and all of that is happening so now a situation has so arisen that the steppy viper this particular beautiful looking snake that is also under threat and this weird looking rat that you see here is the sand mole rat it looks like a character out of some cartoon show so this is also looking at getting completely threatened so make a note of these nordman's birch mouse okay the sand mole rat the steppy viper and the caspian whip snake they are the they are the most threatened by all of this has happened that's this maximum flooding of the river water of water gushing down at huge fo uh, uh, force it is going to lead to some problem for some species well these are the spe species five of them you will have to remember one is the rare ant species nordman's birch mouse three sand mole rat caspian whip snake is four and the beautiful steppy viper is the five okay just note it down you don't have to remember the scientific name this that just the name itself should suffice if you can remember the horrendous face of this and the beautiful figure of the snake even better okay fine so you are also looking at problems of fish spawning what is fish spawning when fish is lay eggs no and then it will be there at the sea bed and eventually say small small baby fishes will come out of it okay that is fish spawning you will see that in particular water areas in fact in in, in fact in just this particular area only so this navigation is stopped for certain times to enable fish spawning don't disturb the fishes right now they are reproducing we need new fishes however with this having again flooding coming 
the fishes, the poor fishes, they are going to lose a lot of their population. The benthic population, what is benthic? Who can tell me what is benthic? Geography students should immediately be able to tell me what is benthic. Benthic is the underlying uh, ecosystem at the river bed or the sea bed. Okay. I'll just write this down for you. Again, for those of you who may not know, at the river bed or the sea bed, you know, whatever population exists, whatever species exist, they are all part of the benthic population. Now, why is the benthic population threatened? Because the water going, so the water level at the source is coming down, whereas in the low-lying areas is going up. So at the source, where there used to be stagnant water, okay, that suddenly has gone. So all of the riverbed, the low-lying, the low-level uh, population of ecosystem that used to exist of organisms, microorganisms, bacteria, this, that, all of them gone. Okay. You're, now you're lo looking at birch and oak forests. You know, massive trees like these, beautiful trees like this that have existed for hundreds of years, gone, all gone. Okay, some of the largest giant oaks. So remember, the five animal species plus birch and oak. And now this is the uh, this is an important one, guys. So just make a note of this also. Obviously, if you need the whole PDF, I will be sharing it in my Telegram group. You can access it there. But I suggest that you make a note of it. So that when you read the article next, you should quickly be able to understand it. So you have 48 objects of the Nature Reserve Fund. Essentially saying that it's, again, a very sensitive area, ecologically sensitive area. You're looking at three national parks, a biosphere reserve, regional landscape, 16 reserves. So much of... Uh, protection has been given for the flora fauna of that area. All of that now stands compromised because of the terrorist action essentially of uh, breaching the dam. Okay. So, this is again important. The Black Sea Biosphere Reserve, like I told you, part of the world network of biosphere reserves, man and biosphere. You must have all read of it, man and biosphere network, all of that. So, you can understand why it is important now. What are the particular species that are affected? What are the particular non-species? Just not the flora fauna, but also the ecosystem. The environment uh, catastrophe essentially is, if you look at it, it's not just from the short term. Short term, obviously, people, their life, everything will be affected. In the long term, you're looking at species that will be wiped out. Irreversible changes that will happen to the area. Okay. You have also got uh, pollution happening through the oil, massive, massive problem in what is an ecologically fragile region. The Black Sea is an ecologically fragile region. So, it's going to be a problem, right? Okay, now that you have noted down all of this, that brings to us, that brings to the end, the first part of our topic today. So, we'll quickly first, before I tell you about this particular series, let's go back and have a look at the question. Now you should be able to answer this question for me. Dnieper River flows from Russia to Belarus to Ukraine and then to Black Sea. Yes, correct. Ukraine often called the breadbasket of the world. Don't get confused that oh, NCRT told me USA was the breadbasket of the world. How come UPSC is telling me Ukraine? No. There are multiple breadbaskets of the world, guys. So Ukraine, obviously rightly called as the breadbasket of the world, has the availability of black churnism, which in organic matter called hummus. Yes or no? Tell me. Even if you do not know the answer to this, can you tell me why black sea is called black sea? Why is it? What could be the reason? The, therein lies the answer. Okay. Ample availability of black churnism, soil rich in organic matter called humus. Absolutely correct. Which of the above are correct? Both. Both are absolutely correct. Okay. Figure out. Go out. Go ahead and answer me this. If you can tell me the answer to this in the comment box below, well, I'll figure out to give you a gift some way or the other. Okay. But have a look at this. So, fine. And this answer, obviously, I'll appreciate. I'll really like anyone who'd like to go ahead and answer these questions, do them. Because once you have written down an answer to these questions, you will not forget it for a long time. Half of the problem is that you can't recall 
that UPSC expects you to remember and recollect a lot of information, but you don't need to remember. All you need to do is internalize the information and you will never forget it. How do you internalize the information? Write it down first. No one has become an IAS, IPS, IRS just by looking at the book. The working of the pen is equally important. Okay? Fine. Now that this has been done, guys, quickly, before I move forward, uh, just 30 seconds to introduce you to this uh, new CSAT specific course that Study IQ IS English has come up with. Well, again, I obviously teach current affairs, I'm responsible for current affairs, international relations, but I'm also someone who has got ample and extensive experience in CSAT. Not just in CSAT, also in CAT, by the way. So that experience is coming in handy given that this year's paper was a rude awakening. It was a slap in the face of the aspirants. Okay. So what essentially is required is that you have a thorough understanding of uh, not just the reading comprehension, but you are looking at maths, you are looking at reasoning. And for this, there needs to be a scientifically enabled approach. Okay. There needs to be a scientifically enabled approach, which means that the student needs to be trained in methods, in tips and tricks, in giving the fundamentals so that the student does not uh, get clean bold as they got clean bold this time. To make sure that that does not happen next year for the students, well, Study IQ IS English has come up with this particular course, 100 classes, to make sure to arm you with the best information. I will be taking care of the reading comprehension and I can assure you that uh, you will not find reading comprehension difficult. In fact, if you go and have a look at the playlist on Study IQ IS English, I have taken reading comprehension classes just prior to CSAT 2023, have a look at them. Also look at my analysis of the CSAT paper. You know, on that very evening after the UPSC examination, I believe uh, that video is possibly the most watched CSAT analysis throughout the country. Okay, so have a look at it. And if that impresses you, if you're convinced, or if you're hopeful, either of that, what I can assure you is that we will invest all our time and effort to make sure that CSAT can't be a problem for you anymore. That is not going to happen. So, the classes are beginning on the 30th of June. We'll have classes every day, 3.30 p.m. Obviously, this is the tentative time. But the whole motive is to make sure that the student is amply uh, fortified against any such bouncers that UPSC might consider throwing. That's not going to happen again. 2023 was the first in the last year that CSAT tried to be smart. No more. Okay. And so, again, if you consider joining and if you want 10,000 rupees off, so, well, here is this, the use this code and I shall see you live in the class, okay? All right. Now, with this having been uh, communicated to you, we'll move on to the second topic for the day, something to do with museums. Museums, oh my God, such a boring topic. Guess what? UPSC loves boring topics. Art and culture. It's not just about Vijayanagar kingdom and this kingdom and that kingdom. It is also about are you preserving those art and culture today? So, the question that I have for you guys, examine the role played by museums of India as agents of preservation and promotion of Indian heritage and what are the challenges faced by them. When was the last time any of you, in fact, <clears throat> went to a particular museum? I don't think so. That's the basic problem. Imagine, forget all of this, you know, we'll do this. Think as an individual, when was the last time you paid a visit to a museum? For those of you who stay in Rajendranagar, Mukherjee Nagar, when was the last time or even when was the only time that you went to these museums uh, uh, near India Gate? Huh? National Archives or uh, IGNCA, have you ever been there? Have you seen the National Museum? You will be happy to see the figure of the dancing lady from the Indus Valley Civilization in, in the NCRT book but you'll never care to go and actually see it. Because again, if you go and see these particular things, you will never forget them for life. Yeah. So which is why museums are important. They do not figure in our daily life. Yeah. People think they're too cool for museums. Okay. So we'll look at what are the challenges and this question, guys. Exactly what UPC can probably, not exactly, but supposedly something that UPC can throw in your faces the next year. And so, the Bengal Natural History Museum, where is it located? Obviously, the name gives it away, it's in Bengal. But is it in Darjeeling? Let me know. Dr. Savita Didi N. Mehta Museum. Regular, uh, regular readers of the Hindu 
if you have been reading Hindu, if you have been in fact following these classes, or if you have been following my 9 p.m. lectures that come every evening, you will see that we have discussed this. Where is it located? Who was Dr. Savita Didi and Mehta? Who can tell me that? And finally, Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Vastu Sangrale. Well, this obviously is in Bombay. This is obviously a straight away a free gift that I've given you. But the answer to this, how many of them are correct? You shall let me know in the chat below. Don't Google, don't Google. Okay. So now that the questions have been introduced to you, let's go ahead and understand very quickly what a museum is. A permanent institution, not for profit. It can't be that it will charge or it will have the profit making motive, which is why you find museums have entry tickets that are very cheap, 20, 25 rupees, 15 rupees, 30 rupees. For the foreigners, obviously, they have a different rate. But for us, US and UNI Indians, it's not a lot. It will not cost you a lot. Service of the society that researches, collects, conserves, interprets and exhibits tangible and intangible heritage. Look at the whole words that you have to use in the answer. If you have a museum based question, start from here. Researches, collects, preserves, interprets. Interpretation also is an important uh, uh, factor that museums need to consider. And thereafter exhibit them. Don't just keep them away that oh my god if the public sees this what will happen no 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 public is educated enough okay open to the public it can't be like the royal times no where the king went conquered some territory bought back riches but the poor public not even got to didn't even get to have a look at it that does not exist anymore whatever you get show it to the public accessible which means at least accessible india campaign you will know have the facilities that everyone and anyone can go in there and access that information. Put it online. Don't just put it offline. Make it universally accessible for everyone. Okay. Inclusive, foster diversity and sustainability. They communicate ethically, professionally. Participation of communities, guys. Museums and communities. This interrelationship is extremely important to understand. Without museums, communities and their stories will get lost. And without communities, there will be no museums. So this interrelationship has to be maintained. And if museums have to be revived, you know, then communities, you and I both, need to be a part of that revival. Okay, offering varied experiences for education, employment, all of uh, 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 all of that. Okay, that is not important. This is the part. What is the role of the museum? The answer to the question lies in the definition itself. Now you have to just expand on these individually. Let's look at the origin of the word museum coming from the Greek word museum, okay, which essentially meant seat of muses and it was used as a philosophical institution, a place for contemplation. All these Greek intellectuals, they would gather around and they would think about the biggest topics of the day. Yeah, people in Calcutta nowadays call that uh, Adda. They'll sit down with a cup of chai in the evening and think about the topics of the day. The Greeks used to call it museum. That's where the museum came from. This hangout of friends and talking about the contemporary topics. Okay. So now in India, you have these different types of museums. Museums of national importance, state museums, archaeological museums, anthropological, Memorial museums, universities, science and tech, private museums, all of them exist. Not very important to remember the classification. However, what you need to remember is that museums can be of two types. One, public museums operated by the government. Two, private museums operated by a private trust or a body. Okay. So now with these two kind of understood, the government obviously will look at catering say all parts of the traditional Indian heritage, right from our evolution till contemporary dance forms, contemporary food, all of that. Private museums are limited in scope. They will only look at a particular incident or a particular person or a particular tangible heritage, not all inclusive. Okay. So now that you've understood this, the private and public museums. Okay. Let's quickly go back and have a look at the history of museums in India. So there is reference to Chitrashala and Bharat Rails. Jataka stories have been mentioned in these.
चित्रशालाज एंड इन भरूत रेल्स ओके सो स्टोरीज प्रीडेटिंग से बुद्धिस्ट मिथोलॉजी एग्जिस्ट है सो दीज हैव एग्जिस्टेड इन द इंडियन थॉट प्रोसेस म्यूजियम्स आर नॉट समथिंग दैट से द वेस्टर्न वर्ल्ड गेव टू अस ओके वॉट यूज टू इवेंचुअली हैपन वॉज लाइक आई टोल्ड यू द रॉयल एंटीक्वेरेंस कलेक्टेड ऑब्जेक्ट्स सो यू वेंट टू वॉर विथ से एक्स स्टेट वेंट टू वॉर विथ वाई डोमिनेटेड वाई किल्ड ऑफ वाई गॉट ऑल देर रिचेज बैक हियर टू देयर कैपिटल हाउ एवर दिस कलेक्शन ऑफ ऑब्जेक्ट्स कलेक्शन ऑफ आइटम्स दैट यूज टू कम फ्रॉम द अदर स्टेट्स द अदर किंगडम्स इट वॉज नेवर ओपन टू द पब्लिक इट बिलोंग टू द प्राइवेट ट्रेजरी और द गवर्नमेंट ट्रेजरी ऑफ दैट किंग देर वॉज नो पार्टनरशिप विद द पब्लिक ओके सो यू हैव द फर्स्ट म्यूजियम दैट केम अप इन द इयर एटीन फोर्टीन by the asiatic society okay opened for the public in 1948 and currently all museums in india the public museums in india not the private museums okay so if you have a statement saying all museums in india are operated or governed by the archaeological survey of india incorrect not all museums are done by the asi the public museums only are controlled or or regulated by the asi the private museums can be by a trust or a body again differentiation is important theek hai this is the impressive headquarter of asi by the way the director of which i think is an is hi om how are you welcome welcome everyone all right so let's look at the national museums new delhi again for those of you who are in uh, rajinder nagar mukherjee nagar or nearby i request you go ahead pay a visit to the national museum once okay you have the indian museum in west bengal calcutta victoria museum ngma national gallery of modern art just near janpath you will find it there too the ngma is branch in mumbai mumbai also has uh, the chhatrapati shivaji vast uh, maharaj vastu sangrahalay also ngma is another in bengaluru allahabad museum salar jung museum in hyderabad another museum in nagarjuna konda and finally one in goa okay goa also has a air force museum i believe so if you just go to goa don't just go and have like enjoyment in in the beaches go and look at the museums also immense information so you have the national museums okay just know the names know the locations not not a lot of uh, explaining here to do so why are museums important quickly custodians and repository of heritage that definition itself guys collects informs interprets transmits that is why they are important they are custodians of our heritage objects that would be lost or that would be auctioned to western fancy houses christies and this and that no they'll be auctioning our our say gandhi ji spectacles or this or that they'll be auctioning so that is it it's a part of our heritage yeah so they hold the heritage they inform and educate community engagement very very important the under appreciated part of the conversation around museums like i told you the relationship between museums and communities if you are able to draw this relationship you can write pages and pages on it okay they connect the past the present the future where we have come from where we are and where ought we to be going okay the journey that we have traveled well it's a time capsule the museum is a time capsule it holds that journey in say through pictures and photos and show objects and all of that okay and it fosters national unity you and i then realize that we have a common origin that say you might be sitting in say tamil nadu and i might be sitting in say bihar and we might have completely different ways of life and language but eventually there will be something that will bind us both in a common strand yeah that we have a common origin that our ways were together that our struggle was together that our happiness also lies being together so museum is important for that it for a diverse country like india you know museums are of extreme importance at least to project and solidify the unity that is required in the society yeah so which is why museums are important again communities guys okay extremely important in the museum uh, sense so the challenges quickly have a look at the challenges guys and make a note of this and you will understand all of this i will share bulbul i will 
at the end of the class i will share my telegram channel link so the challenge is now number one lack of vision and expertise you must have guessed by now who will be the museum director the hard truth i'll give you who will be the museum director an ias officer who is being shunted out okay it's not considered to be a plum posting so if you have a demotivated officer who is in charge of a museum obviously i'm not saying all of them are because again if you look at the museum in delhi uh, uh, an is officer was responsible for the complete uh, you know kaya kalp jisko kehte hindi mein it's a change of of that particular place he made it brilliant the national museum but however the common thing is that you will have someone who is demotivated who really does not know museumology it's a science the art of preservation of conservation of communication of that particular artifact it's a science you know how can someone who's just cleared upsc with a double digit rank be able to understand that science there is no correlation so you have lack of vision and expertise untrained human resource right from the director level up till the guide who will come and tell you sir sir take 200 rupees give me 200 rupees i'll take you on a tour of the museum both of them are equally untrained okay the director like i told you a generalist he is a generalist he or she no idea of what museumology is okay I'll write this down museumology the science of managing museums okay it's how a scientific way in which you approach the museums and then finally you have the guide also who is equally clueless who will give you the same information that you will find in say a wikipedia article so if i have to eventually gain the information from a wikipedia article why did i come to you you should give me anecdotal evidence no why what a particular sword is about what a particular poshak is about or whatever so both of the the king also is clueless the subject also is clueless then you have lack of scientific preservation practices and security in fact in the, the museum from kolkata just in the last 4 5 years you had two very rare artifacts that were damaged not damaged by the public damaged by the people of the museum themselves why because they're untrained yeah it's like how forensic examination you need to have gloves on and this on and that on to make sure that it is not contaminated yeah similarly you need to do the same thing with that you need to be a, there needs to be a standard operating procedure you need to follow that so that you do not compromise the integrity of the artifact they did not no idea okay academia museum disconnect why is this important guys if you look at the uh, definition that i told you have a look at this the definition of this 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 is important you'll understand it here this no interprets who is going to interpret can someone from the museum interpret no a museum is a custodian a museum is someone who is responsible for the upkeep and the maintenance and the safety and the security of that artifact but eventually you are going to require someone from the academy an intellectual to interpret it for you what does a particular coin mean what does a particular motif mean what period is it from so that is necessary which is why you need to have collaborations you need to have people who will be from the academia who will come and do it for you which means that say a particular museum will need to have a particular university or a group of universities with which it is collaborating to interpret the information that it has however our museums don't do that okay funding obviously funding comes from public interest guys okay so a uh, partially we are also responsible for this because we don't turn up in large numbers the government thinks it's not an area of interest no one is going anyway so let's give minimum funding and just chalte raha you know chalte rahega that attitude comes up autonomy the museums do not have any autonomy for minor decisions they'll have to go to the asi if they want to have a simple partnership or collaboration with a university or a college they can't do that okay and displays without context which is again my personal grievance that when i went to say a particular museum so there was this nice looking sword kept there i wanted to know more about the sword none no nothing not even a small signage what what period who whose sword is it whereas if you go to western museums they have in fact say the artifact and then there'll be a small barcode by the side scan it and you get all the information is that not convenient 
आई वॉन्ट टू गेट इन्फॉर्मेशन देर आई एम नॉट जस्ट देर फॉर से मैन सुख जस्ट जस्ट टू लुक एट द आर्टिफैक्ट एंड गो बैक होम सो दैट इज मिसिंग इन इंडियन कॉन्टेक्स ऑल्सो ऑल ऑफ दिस एसेंशियली लीड्स टू डिक्लाइन इन पब्लिक इंटरेस्ट विच इज वाई आई बिगन दिस लेक्चर सेंग हाउ मेनी ऑफ यू हैव बीन टू म्यूजियम्स और गो टू म्यूजियम्स फाइव फ्रेंड्स दे गेट टूगेदर ऑन अ सैटरडे मॉर्निंग देअर प्लान विल बी कम विल गो टू सम मूवी और सम मॉल और दिस दैट नो वन विल से कम लेट्स गो टू म्यूजियम एंड चेक आउट एंड सी वर्ड्स देर इट्स कंसिडर्ड टू अनकूल टू नर्डी ओके सो दिस इज द चैलेंज सो वट हैज द गवर्नमेंट डन सो फार वेल अ फोर्टीन पॉइंट एजेंडा was put forward by the government which would enable the scientific management of the artifacts okay the ministry of culture had put this out that there will be a st standard operating procedure in fact this is what you can understand it okay a standard operating procedure will be introduced digitization that barcode thing only that you should have information photos videos explainers animation about each of your artifacts only then will you be able to arouse public interest okay there is also a website called guys museumsofindia.gov.in have a look at this go ahead after the class log into this website and have a look museumsofindia.gov.in this has been introduced by the government of india again not many would know about this have a look so much of information about your area about a particular king that you want to read about queen that you want to read about okay capacity building training for the hr problems okay for the industry and academia problems so you need capacity and obviously nowadays you have new types of museums coming up the partition sangrahalay the pm sangrahalay has come up pm sangrahalay is in new delhi yes and partition sangrahalay the partition museum is in Jal uh, jallianwala bag amritsar okay so know about these museums also know what role museums are supposed to play okay so now let's go back to the question because i think that should be it yeah so let's quickly ask answer the question and then i shall quickly tell you about my telegram channel so bengal natural history museum like i told you museums are not just about say ashok rule or king vikramaditya or this or that they are also to do with anthropological or archaeological or natural systems bengal natural history museum one of the oldest museums of natural history in india okay located in uh, darjeeling located in darjeeling is correct have a look at it have a look at what it holds online best friend go and have a look at each of these dr savita didi and mehta there is an interesting story if i have time i'll tell you i have 5 minutes okay So Savita Didi was essentially the daughter of an industrialist who used to own a farm in Uganda. Okay? And on that very farm was born Idi Amin. If you have heard the name Idi Amin. On that very farm Idi Amin was born who later became the dictator of uh, Uganda. Okay? So Savita Didi Mehta then uh, with her family came uh, to Gujarat in Porbandar and she had an extensive interest in uh, Manipuri dance. Okay, she is one of the first women who popularized popularized Manipuri dance across the world. So her name is taken in context of the Manipuri dance, guys. Okay, the Manipuri dance. So have a look at Savita Didi also. She is currently in Porbandar, the museum. And finally, the Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Sangrale, which is in Mumbai, again one of the oldest museums in India. How many of the above pairs are correct? All pairs are correct. Okay, so please again consider answering this, guys. I have given you the fodder material for this; it shouldn't be a problem. All right, with that, uh, my dear students, my audience, my my students, I come to the end of this particular analysis class. I hope you liked it. If you did, please do consider leaving me a like or a comment. It really encourages me. Uh, it's hard work to prepare every day to the depth so that I can serve it for you and I can analyze it for you. but then these are the small motivations that a mentor or an educator gets so i'd hope that you consider that and again if you want to join me on my official telegram channel well all you need to do is scan this i don't spam a lot for those of you who are already on the channel you'll know that i don't intend on you know sending you unnecessary texts because there's no point i serve uh, pdfs of my lectures analysis sheets will be served soon 
I look at questions, MCQs, lists will be served. So if that is something that uh, you enjoy, you know, and my questions, my analysis is more to do with an in-depth analysis. I look at making sure that from the prelims to interview perspective, you are fed with all information that is required. You know, not just the fact-based analysis, but also opinion-based analysis. Because up until, say, prelims, facts are necessary. In mains, you need to have analysis. And finally, in the interview, you need to have opinion. So facts and analysis and opinion, this is what my whole uh, uh, thrust of this uh, editorial edge class is. So if you like this class, if you like how we have presented our information, please do consider joining. Uh, it will be great to have you there and we'll make it as interactive as possible. On that note, my dear students, thank you so much for joining me on this Monday morning. I, we have overshot by close to 10 minutes, but that's the nature of the game. Till I see you again tomorrow morning, uh, 8 a.m. with another such editorial edge, another such analysis where we will be looking, taking a look at three, four topics, MCQs, previous year questions, all of that will be included. I hope you consider joining me tomorrow morning also. Thank you. Have a good day. Study well, study hard. I'll see you guys tomorrow morning.